Good morning, Soma family. Thanks for joining us virtually this morning. There is a lot happening at Soma, and so we wanted to take a few minutes and share a couple of things coming up for you and your family. So check this out. Parents, our next generation ministry lead is offering a curriculum for our Soma kids. If you'd like to receive that weekly lesson, you can go to our YouTube page and check out the video. You can give virtually on our website at somajc.org slash give, or you can give via text at the address below. If you would like to go above and beyond and be a blessing to those who have been financially impacted by COVID-19, you can do so by clicking Emergency Relief Fund under the Benevolence Fund on our giving page. If you are new with us today, we want you to feel at home and we're so glad to have you here. For us, church is not like a family, but a functional family, and we want you to know that there is a place perfect for you at SOMA. One of the best ways you can get connected with us is to text the word hello to the number below and fill out the information sometime during the experience. And that's it. Later this week, one of our pastors will connect with you. And once again, thanks for being here and please enjoy the sermon. Thank you so much for joining us with Soma Online. My name is Pastor John, and I'm the pastor of Soma Community Church, and I am so glad that you chose to join us this week. Now, if you're new here, we got a lot going on, but I want to tell those that have come alongside us that if you were planning to do VBS with us, this year we're going to be doing it online. Yeah, you heard me right, virtual VBS. Now, I don't know how all this is going to work, but here's what I do know. If you're on our YouTube page, then you're at the right place. But if you're on our Facebook page, go to the description down below, and there you'll find our registration and a link out to our YouTube page so that you can come alongside and learn what God has for your children each week. We actually have boxes that we have pre-made that we'll be either sending to you as you register your kids, or you can come by Soma and pick them up throughout the week. We want you to have these things and be involved with us. And I cannot wait to see what God does to your children and your family over the next coming weeks when we do our VBS. Go below to our description, sign up, and be ready. Now, if you're here for the sermon and you didn't come for all the other stuff, that is absolutely fine. We want you to join in. But we also want you to jump in the description because there's so many things going on down there from ways to give, but also ways to worship with us. But we, the reason we want you to do that is because we want you to get the full experience of what Soma is. So as you join in this week, open to Ruth chapter 2 as we learn about God's loving kindness in your life. And really, the question is how you choose to see the world. You know, the past is a hard thing. The future is a better thing. But God is the only thing that really matters. Strap in this week, grab your Bible, and let's see what God has for you. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also if anything but death parts you and me. Peace be with you. And also with you. Guys, how are you doing today? I am so glad that you're here. Grab your Bibles, turn to the book of Ruth. Turn to the book of Ruth. We're going to be uh, back in the book of Ruth, actually, for the whole summer, right? Uh, and, and we're going to be digging into the things of Ruth uh, in, in Naomi and that kind of relationship that is going on there. I, I hope that you have enjoyed your time. And, and I, I just want to say something right here at the uh, outset. I, I want to give you a picture of two different things. I'm going to throw it up on the screen here. I want you to see these two different things because uh, there's two different things. And I, and I think it's something that kind of helps you understand in society. Now, um, I, I have a son who loves nature. So as I say this, I understand uh, we've got a young man over here loves nature. Also, I understand that by saying this, I'm running on dangerous water, but I'm gonna give you some generalizations that society tends to have. Okay. Uh, uh, number one, this is a vulture, right? A vulture, turkey vulture. Is that correct? Nehemiah? All right, so the, 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 the vulture uh, generally is seen as dark, foreboding, um, and let's face it, it's downright ugly. 
Uh, it's, it is not a good thing. Now, there's a reason why it has a bald head, but, but it's, it's not a beautiful creature. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have this beautiful hummingbird, right? Which, you know, everybody sees it like, oh, that's so pretty, right? You know, even Apple used it for the new iPads, it, it, how beautiful it really is. Um, I don't know if they talk like I do when they see something pretty, but that's what it is. And hummingbird, it, it, in contrast, is, is, is beautiful and, and, and has a little bit of wonder to, wonder to it. Um, it has a heart rate, that, heart rate that is similar to a small child. Like, they, they just kind of out of control. They run off of sugar. Um, it, it's, it's really amazing uh, the kind of animals they are. But these two dissimilar birds... These two dissimilar birds are, are hard to find, yet they both can be found in the same living area, which is a desert. Both of these pictures are taken in deserts. They both live in similar places, though they're, they're almost the exact opposite of what they are. Both a hummingbird and a, a, a vulture fly, right? They, they fly over the desert and they struggle to survive just like everything in the desert. But each sees something extremely different. You see, uh, a vulture sees rotting meat. That's what they are. They're, they, 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 they go around and they find dead animals. The reason why their heads are bald is because they shove their heads inside of animals and eat the entrails. It's, it's really nasty, but that's what they do. They are the vacuum cleaners, the dirt pickup of our nature. Ew, right? Like if you see one on the side of the road, it, they're doing us a, dis, a service, right? For all the deer that you and your friends have hit, they're cleaning them up for us. They thank you for your service, right? Um, and and that's, that's what they do. So as they fly around, they look for dead things. If it smells bad, if it's about to explode in the hot summer sun, you, you get the idea, right? Because today is going to be one of them days. It's hat and they're going to be like, yes. They're going to be flying in circles above you. You'll see the shadows. That's what they're looking for. They thrive on that diet. Yet hummingbirds actually ignore everything smelly, you know, like regular people. Like we, they ignore the smelly flesh, the dead rotting carcasses around them. And, and instead they look for these beautiful blossoms. They, their eyes are looking for those beautiful blossoms where they can find nectar, sugar, uh, and really they're hyperactive creatures. But that's what they're looking for. They're looking for something that can keep their hearts going. And, and the, the vulture lives on what was. The vulture lives on what was. They live on the past. They fill themselves on what's dead and gone. And hummingbirds live on what is. Hummingbirds seek new life, and they fill themselves on the freshness of life. They, they, if you notice, there's not a lot of blooms that happen in the middle of the desert, but yet they're the ones that find said blooms and feed off that newness and freshness of life. And it seems to me that maybe we as a people aren't all that different from vultures and hummingbirds. We as people really aren't all that different. You see, it depends on how you look at the world around you on how you actually are. And see, the last few weeks, we've kind of been running our way through the book of Ruth, right? We, we've been digging in. We're in chapter two. We slowed down. I promised last one in chapter two. We're getting chapter three next week. But we're getting there, right? We're moving our way forward. And Naomi and her husband, Eliz uh, Elimelech, they, 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 they went off to a foreign land in Moab. They wanted to find new things. They had two sons. They were living in Bethlehem. Famine hit. They said, hey, I want to get out of this place. I want to get something new. They wanted God to provide for them, and they decided that God could provide by them doing what they thought was best, which never really works out well. This, just a word of warning to you, right? And instead of trusting God to provide what they need, they moved to Moab and, and they moved to their enemy's home for sustenance. And, and they were longing to find new hope. Everybody say new hope. If you watch Star Wars, you know exactly what I'm talking about. New hope, right? So they were looking for new hope and new life. And really what, what, what they became was a picture of those who seek and find hope in the world rather than walking with God. They found, they found hope in the world instead of walking with God. They end up fi uh, finding through all of this something quite different than what they had dreamed of. And they tried. Instead of life and hope, they were overcome by death and despair. Instead of uh, Elimelech and his two sons, we're all going to die in the, in the upcoming days. In this foreign land, Elimelech goes first, and sometimes later after that, his, his sons die after they marry. And you can imagine that Naomi in this moment is a broken woman. Over the course of 10 years of her life, she had one heartache after another after another. She, she, she loses everything that she knows. She has grief upon grief upon grief. Maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe you're here and you look at your life and you think to yourself, yo, I can relate with that. I've had enough crud go on in my life. I, 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 I've turned around. I thought God would help me out with this. And every time I turn around, it seems like another boulder, another rock, another thing. And, 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 and my life is like that as well. 
Maybe you're saying that. Maybe you're not saying that loud, but maybe internally you're saying that. It's full of grief and sorrow and shattered grief, dreams. And the hurt and the pain is very deep and very real. Ruth is one of the Moabite women, one of the Moabite women that Naomi's uh, sons had married, right? And, and Naomi, and like Naomi, she too experienced grief. She lost her husband. She lost her man. She was happy. Naomi sets out to return to Bethlehem, and, and Ruth says, hey, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a life-changing decision. I, at this point, I, I, I don't know who your God is, who your people is, where you're going, but I'm going to go with you. I mean, it's a kind of a crazy thing when you think about it, because she gives up everything, not just something, everything to follow her mother-in-law. Now, just side note, how many of you married people are going to follow your mother-in-law somewhere? <laughs> this is just an honest moment. We're in church. You should be honest, right? A lot of us internally are like, nah, I'm good. Go ahead and miss me with that. Yet, she must have been good enough that she said, I'm going to go with my mother-in-law back home. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Where you die, I die. That's a little extreme, but that's what she says. I'm going where you go. And, and the, listen, the people of Israel weren't her people. She didn't know them. She didn't know who they were. She's a picture of someone who does not initially know God, but someone who comes to faith in him nonetheless. And she says to Naomi, where you go, I'll go. Where you die, I die. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That's a picture of repentance, if I've ever seen one. That's a picture of life change. She's leaving behind the past in looking towards the future. Now, Naomi is something like a vulture that we talked about earlier. And not that she's bad, but she's living off the past. Everything in her life is bitter. She even goes back home and they go, hey, it's Naomi. She's like, call me bitter. Like, she's like, I got a whole different nickname. Remix it like that. I'm bitter now. And I get it. You lost your husband and both your sons. You're in a foreign land. You thought God was going to bless you over here and you lost everything. Yeah, I feel like a vulture too. What's dead? What's gone? What's behind? I'm going to feed off that in my life. Whereas Ruth is like, you know something? I... I see, I see the future. I see, I see these blossoms. And, and there's not much. There's one blossom over there and one blossom over there. And I got to fly to get there. But I see that. I see what God is doing for me right now. So I got an odd soul tattoo for you today. Soul tattoo, if you've never been here before, is one sentence that if you get this, you get everything else I'm saying for the rest of the day. Half y'all fall asleep anyway, right? So like, I want you to get this and I want you to understand this. I'm gonna put it up on the screen and I want you to read it. And it depends on how you read it and what you're gonna get out of it. You see, I'm not sure what you, what you, what you see when you look at that word. Because Naomi saw something like God is nowhere. That, that's what Naomi saw up there. When she was in her vulture state, when her past, she saw God as nowhere. But you see, if you're acting like Ruth, if you're living right like Ruth, then God is now here. You see, it depends on the way that you look at life, on how you're going to move forward in it. You see, Naomi and Ruth had two completely different ways. So I, I put the soul tattoo out there for you to wonder how your eyes actually see it. Is it God is nowhere or God is now here? You have to make that decision in your life. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to grab God's word, turn to Ruth chapter 2. I want you to stand in the honor of reading of God's word. We're going to start in verse 17. Ruth chapter 2, starting in verse 17. And the word says, So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and had about an epith of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned, and she also brought out and gave her food that was left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? Where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and, and she said, That man's name whom I work with today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her mother-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness is not forsaken, the living or the dead. Naomi said to her, the, the man is a close relative of ours, our Redeemer. Ruth the Moabite, uh, uh, and Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall stay close to my young man and have finished my har uh, until I have finished my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young, uh, young woman, lest another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to young uh, women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Let's play. 
Father, I thank you so much that you give us the opportunity to look at life from so many different lenses. I thank you that we have two women that have, that have arrived in Bethlehem at the time of harvest and that you've given them decisions on how to look at the world. And even right now in our life at a time of harvest, you give us the opportunity to either harvest out of the past or harvest moving towards the future, but to look to you for our sustenance. Jesus, we need you. We need you right now because we are in times that we do not understand, that we've never lived, for, lived through, nor do we grasp. But we grasp that you are God and that you are here and that you are good. And so we submit ourselves to you. Use us, Jesus, for your glory. Help us to be about your work and give us the strength to see the world through your eyes. Father, let the word soak into our brains and move into our hearts. Let it change our hearts and move into our feet so it works into actions in our lives. We ask this in your precious name and all God's saints say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So God's got plans for you. God's got plans, and this is what happens. God's got plans, and God says, either I'm now here or I'm nowhere. Which one do you choose? You, 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 you have to choose something right now, right? I love that Naomi uh, and, and Ruth have to choose this the same way that we do. I love that as we look at the book of Ruth, we find a lot of parallels to where we are right now. Because, I mean, we've talked about the Rona Blues, right? We, we've talked about it being kind of sad right now. It's hard right now. But we, we, as we talk about it, we also see that you may, as, long, as well as Naomi, be in despair. You may be in the middle of despair. But God is now here. These two women arrive in Bethlehem at a time of harvest. Coincidence? I don't think so. They, they arrive at the time of harvest. Ruth has gone out to the field hoping to find favor in someone's eyes, right? She, she talks to a guy, a guy named Boaz, which, again, naming, just don't do that to your child, please. Please, just from me to you, I love you. Good. Okay, so Boaz uh, is in the field, um, and he sees her, and he's like, hey, she's cute. That's literally what happened. Uh, hey, she's cute. Who's that? She looks different. She acts different. And so he begins to have a conversation, finds out that this is, this is the lady that everybody in Bethlehem had heard about, that had left her home, and come with her mother-in-law. Again, amazing feat within itself. Small miracle, right? She comes with the mother-in-law, and now she's out here working for her mother-in-law to get them food. And, and, and he actually talks to his worker saying, hey, make sure she gets the hookup. That's my edited version, but that's what he said. Make sure she gets the hookup. Make sure she got a little extra grain. Make sure she's taken care of. Even invites her out to a little lunch date. Gives her some roasted grain. Think potato chip, right? Think chi chips and guac, okay? So like share some chips and guac, Chipotle style, right? And, and they have a little, little, little date, little group date. It's, it's nice. He gets to know her. And, and by the way, just we talked about this on Thursday night. The reason why they talk in a, in a group setting is, is the same reason that I'd want to talk. Like when, when Mama Heather and I were dating, it was, it was so much fun because we had friends around us that would, go, that would look at us and go, yeah, he's legit or no, he's not legit, which was all on me. She was legit, right? So they're trying to figure out if I was legit or not, right? And, 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 and that's a part of what's going on right now is there, this is a this is part of him trying to figure out, is, this, is she legit? And he does. He figures that out. And they glean in the field, and, 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 and this foreigner who sticks out like a sore thumb amongst everybody else comes there, and God seems to have other plans than just her plans. Ruth goes and finds favor in someone's eyes, though she was just looking to work for the day. And she finds more than she could have possibly imagined. Why? Because God has been working behind the scenes all along. We talked about when we started this book that we're, we're, we're not, this book doesn't always start off with God. It didn't start off like, hey, God did this and hey, God did this. It just shows you God working. It's a lot like your life. When, when we're out there yelling, God is nowhere, he's working behind the scenes in your life. When, when we're out there struggling, running into sin, God is right there going, yeah, I'm still working. I'm working to break you, to break you of your sin, to bring you back to faith. You see, God has other plans, and so it happens that as Ruth goes, hoping to find favor in someone's eye, uh, eyes, she finds so much more. And because God is working behind the scenes to bless this young woman, that she might know him. Instead of simply finding favor, she experiences abundant grace. Abundant grace. I, I love God's love for me. It's a, 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 what I like to call circular reasoning, Right? Because God's like, I love you. And, and then we go, why? Because I can't do anything to earn it. And he goes, I know, because I love you. 
And, and then you're like, but, but I, did, I did bad last night. And he's like, yeah, I understand. I love you. And we're like, yeah, but I gave you the finger. And he's like, yeah, cool. I love you, right? Like any parents in the room understand this concept. We, we do this to our kids all the time because our kids act a fool. And we're like, hey, I love you. Matter of fact, we, we, we tell our kids, there's nothing you can do to ever make me stop loving you, so stop trying. Right? That, that's, that's God's line to us. Stop trying. But that's what we do. We constantly push back on them. And, and God gives us this abundant grace. We don't deserve it. It's not like you earned it. It's not like we worked really hard and God's like, yeah, yeah, he deserves that. He did a good job today. That's not the way it works. God just gives it. Why? Because he loves you. But, but what else? That's it. End of story. Period. I heard somebody say on period. Okay, on period. Like that's the way it ends. No, not too much? Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. While Boaz may be a picture of Jesus Christ, he is not sinless like Jesus Christ. He's just a picture of Jesus Christ. He gives us a, a fuzzy snapshot of who Jesus is. And, 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 and this is beautiful because when, in Jesus, we experience those richness of his grace as well. And through life's kindness at Boaz, God is preparing, is preparing us for the life and the ministry of who Jesus is. That, that's a beautiful thing. We saw last week how Boaz welcomed Ruth. Didn't have contempt for this foreigner as he should have. But he, with the grace of God, he showed her what it's like to be grafted into the family. He, he doesn't hold her past against her. He could have held her past. Oh, you're a Moabite. You know what your people did to my people? He didn't do all that. He didn't say, hey, you're a foreigner. You're not from here. You don't act like me. You don't, no, no, no. He says, come on in. Come on in. I, I want you to come on in. And there's a lesson here, isn't there? Because maybe you know what it means to be a prisoner to your past. Maybe you got a past. Maybe your past is your present. Maybe you got uh, something that's going on right now and you're just like, I don't know what to do. And you're hoping everybody around you forgets what's going on or never finds out. But God says, I still love you. And I still want to bring you in. You see, a lot of us live with low-grade guilt. It's like a low-grade fever. It is kind of always persistently there. We don't know what to do with it. It's just kind of humming around. We're not really sure what we can do, but God says, hey, I want you. And Ruth finds herself in unexpected favor and grace in the fields of Boaz. Not because of her past or anything she can do, but friends, because the Lord's favor doesn't struggle to free your life. His favor does not struggle to be free in your life. As, as chapter 2 draws to a close, as we finish this out, Ruth and Naomi are still widows. Ruth is still working and working hard in the fields despite, uh, while not desperate, it's still a struggle. But they've turned a corner. They've seen God's faithfulness even in the hard times. They've seen God show up even when we didn't think it was, it was going to happen. Hope has been born in their hearts. Something is starting to bubble up here. Ruth's faith has not come up empty. Because Ruth gave up a lot. That's a lot of faith to go all the way to Bethlehem during the harvest. But God had been moving in their lives, and they were beginning to see it. Ruth comes back from Boaz's field. She, she uh, uh, um, the first night, having experienced this abundant grace, and, and she's probably overjoyed, like, yo, yo, I got roasted grain today. I didn't even expect that. I got an FF, which, by the way, is about 22 liters of grain. So it wasn't like he was leaving a little bit. He wasn't even being subtle about it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, my, my bottle there is a liter. He, he left 22 of those of grain. That's a lot of bread, literally. Like, that's ridiculous. But he said, hey, come through. He offered her lunch. He offered her refuge. He offered her a place to work. According to the scripture, Ruth worked hard. She was in the fields early. She worked diligently throughout the day, and she didn't return home till later that night. And it wasn't just because of Boaz's grace. She did it because she wanted to and knew that she needed to survive which, by the way, talks about a good work ethic. But when she went home that night, she went down with a burden, a burden that laid on her back, and she wasn't sure about it. She knew that she was going to receive her way, but she didn't just want to work for Boaz. She wanted more for her life. When she went home, she went as one who had experienced amazing grace, and grace abundantly. By its very nature, that can't be earned, guys. God's grace in your life cannot be earned. Matter of fact, if you're taking notes today, it'll give you two points. The first one is this. There's grace by which we are forgiven. There's one part of grace that you have to understand that there's grace by which you're forgiven. When it comes to Jesus in faith, you, he's humble and, and, and we are repentant of the past and all the shame and heartache and sin is washed away in Jesus, which is a beautiful thing. 
If you've never experienced that, I want you to experience that today. But the Bible tells us that we become new creations. Never say new creations. New creations. Say it like you mean it. Say it one more time. New creations. New creations. New creations in Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, if you've never marked up your New Testament, every single time you mark, you should mark every single time it says in Christ, by Christ, through Christ. You'll notice a lot of it is in, through, and by Him. You are new creations in Christ. The old has passed away, the new has come. That's a beautiful thing. In, in other words, when people come up to you and bring you your past, right? Like that happened to me. I remember I first got saved and I went back home and people were like, hey, we're doing such and such and we're going out to so and so. We're doing this, that, and third. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Nah, but man, you used to help us out. Remember, you used to lead us, right? Nah, I'm good. You, you know how people just want to drag you back to your past. And bring it back up and, and drag you back to who you used to be. And you're like, but that's not me anymore. It takes a little time for them to understand that. But when they see it, they go, oh, oh, there's something new. There's something different. Matter of fact, when my sister got baptized, she said, now I get why you've been acting weird all these years. <laughs> I love that. That's one of my, uh, I cherish that in my heart. That's a beautiful thing. First Corinthians tells us, so Second Corinthians tells us, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're no longer prisoners of your past. You're not prisoners of your past. Listen, if you're not a believer, you don't have to be a prisoner of your past. Oh, well, Pastor John, I'm not a prisoner of my past. I'm good. Really? Like, really? Like, let's, be, let's keep it 100 real quick. Really? Because let somebody bring that up and see if, it doesn't, if you don't feel some type of way. Let, let that come up in a, a job application or, heck, on any type of social media and see if you don't feel some type of way. You see, it's funny because I have, I have pictures that pop up from my past. I got lots of pictures, pictures I'd rather you never see, that pop up. But you know something? It is what it is. That was old John, this is new John. That's B.C., this is A.D., right? Before Christ, after death. I, I'm a new creation. I'm a different dude. I'm okay with it. But if you don't have shame about it, which is okay, some of us don't. I, I, I remember as a non-believer going, man, I don't have any shame. I, I am who I am. That's cool. Except for when somebody brings it up and then you privately feel it in your heart of hearts. And you try to play it off like you don't, but you really do. You see, that's the part I'm talking to. I'm not talking about out here. We can play it off all we want out here. I'm talking about in here. Christ says you're a new creation here. He gives you, a, takes your heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. That's what we're talking about. And you may be a prisoner of your past, but you've never had peace in the present, nor hope for the future, because you're haunted by where you've gone. You see, Ruth's story should fill you with hope, because it, it, her story is a story of redemption, though that she's done nothing to earn it. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But for those of you who take refuge in God, also there's God's grace in his provision. God provides. He provides for those who seek him in faith. It doesn't mean that every earthly desire that you have will be met. I, I wish that were so. I would have a Jaguar outside and be a very happy man. But that's not what we're talking about, right? That's, that's not what we're talking to say. We're saying that God will provide and provide abundantly what you need. There, there's a story I remember reading as a brand new Christian about a guy named George Mueller. Have you ever heard of him? Probably not, exactly. Uh, he was born in 1805, so I like reading books of dead people, and this is one of them. Um, and he, he died in March 10th in 1898. Uh, during his lifetime, he founded 117 Christian schools. Because he was bored, I guess. Like, he had a lot to do, right? 117 Christian schools. And who would educate in his lifetime over 120,000 children. Yeah, it's insane. Many of whom were orphans. Matter of fact, orphans had a very special place in George Mueller's life, uh, in his heart, uh, as, as they do in God's heart also. Mueller began his work with orphans by opening his own home to them. And, and he would bring in as many as he possibly can, and he would take them and provide and care for them. But quickly what happened is it outgrew the space that he had, and it quickly outgrew the money that he had. And, and, and so he then began to try to get other people to build homes or other orphanages or figure things out. And his, house, his houses that he bought and that he acquired end up having several hundred children. But by the time of his death, he didn't have money to provide food, clothing, all this other stuff, and education for over 10,000 children. So what did he do? What did he do? Did, did, he, did he go out and ask for funds? No. Did he go to the bank and get a loan? No. Did, did, he, did he go play the lottery? Heck no. No, no, he didn't do any of that. No, you know what he did? He prayed. Because prayer is the engine of the Christian life, not the caboose. 
he started with prayer. He said, I'm a praying man, and I'm going to pray, and God will begin to answer my prayers. Let me give you one example of uh, among many that you could read in this guy's life, and I'm telling you, it is amazing. But here's one. It, 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 he gave, you guys ever give thanks before you eat your meal? He was one of the people that helped really normalize that. The reason being is because they didn't always have enough food to feed everybody. And so he would normalize that he would say, I'm going to give thanks during meal times. And at a time of morning meal on a particular day, they th gave thanks to, the go uh, to God while the children were sitting at the table, even though there was literally no food in the house. And as they finished praying, there's a knock on the door. As they finished praying, there's a knock on the door. And there stood a baker with enough fresh bread to feed everybody in the house. God answered their prayers and provided for their needs. And that wasn't all. They had fresh milk. They had, uh, 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 they had their needs met morning and night after morning and night. It just happened because they chose to trust God for their provision. It's, it's amazing. When you read his life, it's story after story after story after story. And you just go, well, what is this? But then I look at Ruth and I see her trusting the God of provision, saying, I, I have my family and my friends and my coworkers and everybody back here that I know and love and all the safety net that I have in my past, but I'm going to move towards the present. I'm going to move towards God. I'm going to let him provide for me. I, I'm going to ask him for permission. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to do my work. I'm going to go into the field. I'm supposed to go in the field. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do what I need to do. And, and, he, and she provides. And then Boaz says, hey, I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to give you a little extra. I'm going to bring you up a little bit more. Friends, that's what the grace of God does. That is provision. And at the time, God has so richly, uh, richly blessed Ruth that while she worked in the field, he provided so much for her that she could have ever asked. Now, Naomi is overcome. When she sees the abundance of what Ruth returns with, right? She sees it. She's like, yo, who, who? my translation again, who you been working with, Right? Like, I remember coming home with a little extra money. My mom was like, who, who'd you steal from, right? Like, it's, it's one of those kind of moments. It's like, well, you brought a little bit extra home. What happened? You, you, you take somebody else's grain? Like, she, she's, but she's overcome, right? She's happy. Ruth is asking who field she's working in because obviously you've been richly blessed. She's so excited that she didn't even wait for the answer. If you notice, she didn't even wait for, uh, Naomi, uh, for Ruth to answer, right? Naomi's like, who'd you work with? Praise God, right? Like, it's, it's not even the whole answer. It's just like, ah, yes, Jesus, like, she's so happy and understands who is doing it. What is she doing? She's giving thanks and praise to God for the response of experience of his grace. Have you done that? Have you praised God for the experience of grace in your life? Have you seen a place where he's blessed you? And, and, and a lot of times we see it. Like, I'm bad about this. I'll, I'll, I'll put myself on front street. I Like, if you give me a present, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't know what to do. Notice my wife is nodding. I don't know what to do. I get a present, and I'll look at you, and you'll like, hey. I'm like, and then I'll, I, sometimes I walk away. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'm supposed to open it. I don't know the etiquette. I need to read, like, Google it. I'll Google it this afternoon. Like, I'm supposed to open it or something, right? I don't know. And so I don't know what to do with the presence. And a lot of us do that with God's presence in our life, right? He gives us the presence of his grace and his mercy and abundantly overflows our life. And we look at him and go, and we just walk off. And it's like, no, 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 wrong action, wrong action. Her, her action is praise God, right? Exactly, Malik. It's, it's praise God. That's exactly what you're supposed to do in that moment. And, and I should learn to do that with presence. I'm learning. Just be patient with me. But like, this is what she does. It's correct. It's right. Do you do that when God blesses you? Or do we just kind of look like, well, I mean, I'm glad you gave that to me, God. I, I, I'm glad you gave that to me. I deserve that, right? that's really the attitude we're showing him in that moment when we say that. When we don't give him thanks in that moment. You see, even when Job's life fell apart and his wife said, curse God and die. Which, by the way, side note, she gets a bad rep. I'm on her side. Okay, I don't say that. Like, if I was in that situation, I'm on her side. Yo, yo, like, what is going on? God obviously has damned you. Like, this is, this is where I, I would feel in that moment, but that's not what's going on. Job, in the middle of all of that, chose instead to trust God and said, I shall accept from God Good and not bad? Woo, what a question. That, that hurt my feelings the first time I read that, because I was like, yeah, I get Job's wife. And he's like, I, should I accept the good and not the bad? Okay, fine, Job, be holy, whatever. But that's what happens in this moment. Naomi has already accepted the bad from God. Remember? She said, God has made me bitter. But now she's accepting the good. 
Praise God for what you gave. This extra grain. I, I didn't do nothing for this. Matter of fact, I've done everything to rebel against God, yet he gives it to me. She cries out and saying, he has not stopped showing his loving kindness to the living or the dead. Oh, I love that. She's like, he's still showing kindness to my husband, though he's dead and gone. And my boys, though they are dead and gone. Because he's taking care of us, which they were done. Now, I love this. She's referring to God's kindness. Listen, grace flows downhill from him to you. God's grace ought to be flowing in your life and grace out of your life into others' lives. You should, you should have the overflow of God's grace going into people's life around you. People should be blessed by your very presence and they should want to give praise to a holy God going, my God, look at this. Look how he's blessed me. This is amazing. My thought here is that Naomi is referring just to God. He's the one that had given uh, that sh- that she thought had given up on her, but he hadn't. She's the one that had feared that he had turned his back on her, but he hadn't, or rejected her, but he hadn't. Maybe you feel the same way. You're like, well, I've done all this stuff, Pastor. You, you don't even know my past. Y- yeah, but God hasn't. God hasn't given up on you. Maybe your family has, but God hasn't. Maybe your coworkers have, but God hasn't. It does not matter what your past is. I promise you, everything you have in your life, everything you've done in your life is JV compared to the people in the Bible. Like, just read the Bible. There's some ratchet stuff in there. And these people are considered our, you know, like we're supposed to look up to them. They are messed up. My favorite's Moses. He has anger problems. I get him, right? You know what happened? You know there's two sets of Ten Commandments, right? The first set, he got so angry because the people started worshiping another god, he ground up, threw into, uh, ground up the cow that they were worshiping, threw it into a lake, and made everybody drink it. After breaking the tablet that God literally wrote with his own finger. Yeah, I get him. I get him. I, I feel Moses. Like, I felt him in that moment. I was reading, I was like, yeah, I feel you, bro. Other people that are more holy are like, you shouldn't have done that. But like, I get him, right? Then you could read David. Boy, he's ratchet. Right? Like... <laughs> Read every prophet. My son asked me, he goes, Daddy, does all the prophets sin? I'm like, bro, yes. <laughs> Whew. Whew. Read them. They're not pretty. So whatever you've done, but I stole, okay, cool, JV, maybe freshman team. It's not anything compared to these guys. God still has not forgiven you, has not, forgiven, has not forgotten you. He's forgiven you, my goodness. <laughs> Wrong thing to say. Let me keep going. God has not forsaken you after all. Listen, I, th- there's a word that I taught you a couple weeks ago. It's a, a Hebrew word. I'm going to see if you remember it. It is the word chesed. Anybody remember that word? Remember you guys said the back of the throat, kind of like your... There you go. That's good. Please do not spit on your neighbor. Please do not spit on your neighbor. But the word means loving kindness. God shows his loving kindness. Perhaps you feel like God has rejected you. He's turned your back on you. He's left you hanging, but he hasn't. And maybe because of all of that, you feel like your heart has grown bitter because you're like, God has left me, but he hasn't. Matter of fact, I want to give you the second point and then we'll land the plane. It says this. God's kindness has gone farther than Ruth understood or Naomi could have imagined. Matter of fact, I'll say it this way. God's kindness has gone further than you can understand or can imagine. It turns out that uh, Boaz was, relative, uh, was a relative of Elimelech, which I think is kind of cool. He was, he, was, he was on that side of the family. And so Boaz was there, and he was what they would call a kinsman redeemer. Everybody say that with me. Kinsman redeemer. It's an Old Testament term I'll define here in a little bit, but it, it, it will really dig into the importance of that over the next couple weeks. But a redeemer, a redeemer means to save or to rescue something or to buy back from someone else. A redeemer is, then is one who pays the ransom price to buy back whatever or whoever is in need of redemption. Sound familiar? In Ruth's day, a kinsman redeemer had the right to act on behalf of a relative in trouble or in danger. Think if you go to jail, they bail you out, right? That, that's a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer had three responsibilities. Number one, he could redeem property of a relative. So if property was taken from a relative, he could go and buy it back. If they're in financial trouble, he might sell some land or sell some of his property in order to make sure that they could pay off their debt. A kinsman redeemer would buy the land back, restore it to the one who had lost in the first place. Kind of cool. Number two, they would also sell, they might even sell themselves into slavery. 
a little extreme, but that's something they would do. In order to provide for the needs to pay off debt, a kinsman redeemer would purchase someone's freedom for them. So when you think of slavery, side note, because I don't need more slavery in my family. Let's talk about it. Uh, we're not talking about chattel slavery of North America. We're talking more of like your credit cards, okay? Slaves back then could do everything that everybody else could do. Heck, Joseph was a slave and he was the prime minister. Uh, that would not happen during chattel slavery here in the United States, okay? So when you sell yourself into slavery, it's called in, indentured servitude. You're working underneath somebody. It's no different than you and your visa. All right, number three, that is slavery. Okay, number three, <laughs> most importantly of Ruth's story, if a man were to die and they had no male heir, their kinsman redeemer, usually, a deceased bro- uh, usually the deceased brother, would marry the widow and raise up the child in the name of their brother or somebody in their family, the dead relative. Many, uh, it's kind of an old custom, but a way of thinking about it, but it actually meant that they would provide for their needs. In order for someone to be a kinsman redeemer, though, they had to meet three criteria. Number one, they had to be related. Kind of easy. Number two, they had to be able to redeem. They had to have the money. They had to be able to do it. And number thirdly, they had to be willing to redeem. I had a friend of mine in my Bible study way back in the day, and uh, he was 27 years old when he passed away. Um, and he was married for less than a year to his beautiful bride. Um, and we went around her. We had just got done reading, uh, studying the book of Ruth. And so we got really up and we're like, we're going to be your kinsman redeemer, which by the way, legally they wouldn't let us do in the States. But uh, we said, hey, we're going to do everything you need since Brandon's God and take care of you. That's what a kinsman redeemer does. So whenever, when she needed a new roof, our whole Bible study showed up, a bunch of 20 something men. I don't even know if that roof's still on there, but we, <laughs> we did our best to put a roof on our house, right? When, when she needed a new car or when she needed anything, we took care of her until she got married. Like that, that's our job as her redeemer. Does that make sense? This is what's happening in this passage. You see, that's the background. And suddenly Naomi realizes, oh, your Boaz is one of our people. Oh, snap, he's showing you kindness. He's one of us. Yo, again, my translation, not in here, but like that's what she's saying in that moment. Like, yo, this is crazy. It's going to make all the difference to the future of these two women. In fact, God has not forgotten them. God had not forsaken them. God was setting them up for the beautiful uh, blessing that he had in their life. His provision was abounding to them. Their bounty, the harvest, the person like a kinsman redeemer. Uh, it's so beautiful because though they did not see it, God was on the move. He was working. He was working. So here's the question for you. When you throw up the soul tattoo, what do you see? Just in your head, what do you see? God is nowhere, or God is now here. You see, at the beginning of the passage, I think Naomi started off like the vulture, where she's looking at the past and feeding off the past, living off the past, and letting that drive her life. And she's like, God is nowhere. I don't know what to do. I lost my husband and my sons. I, I, I can't do it anymore. And then all of a sudden, Ruth comes home with a little bit of grain. She goes, oh, that's good. Comes with a little bit more. Oh, wow, that's good. Comes home with 22 liters. Yo, who are you talking to? Right? Oh, I was in Boaz's field. Oh, he's one of our people. Whoa, what's God doing? Praise God, what's going on, right? She moves very quickly from living off the past and feeding off of death to all of a sudden moving towards the future and looking for those little blooms of hope where she can feed and live. What about you? Where do you land? You can live off your past all you want, but I promise you it's only gonna, it, it'll feed you, don't get me wrong, but it's feeding off of death. You see, where Naomi once saw hopelessness and despair, she began to see something else. She begins to see potential for future that she never dreamt was possible. And perhaps, perhaps right now you're in a desert place in your life. Perhaps you're in the middle of your life and you're just like, I, I don't get it. I don't get the future. I don't get the past. I don't get it. But well, here's what I want you to discover. I want you to discover, just like Naomi and Ruth, that the gracious hand of God is often moving in gracious act of men and women all around you that are called by his name and called blessed. How God shows you his hesed, his loving kindness, though you don't deserve it. Together, guys, we can experience that grace in your life, even through the darker moments of your life. I want to challenge you today with this, and I'll leave you. Where are you? Where are you? Are you, he's here, or he's nowhere? You have to make a decision and begin to move forward. You have to understand where he is in your life and begin to move forward. You have the opportunity to do that today. You see, 
Jesus is the better Boaz. And, and while you may not know what you have in your life, but God says, hey, I'm going to bring you in so you can actually glean from my fields, and I will give you all the grains that you don't deserve, but I'm going to give them to you because I want them to have them for you. And, and God says, listen, I have more for you than you ever could have imagined, not because you've done anything to earn it, but because I love you. You know that circular reasoning again? I love you, but why? Because I love you. But what I didn't do, it, but I love you. God does that because he loves you. Maybe you've never experienced that in your life today, but God says today is the day that you can begin to experience that. You don't have to live in the past anymore. The future has something bright and beautiful and something good for you. Our Father not just wants to bless you, but wants to change you and make you a new creation in Him. Today's the day, if you haven't, that you get to receive Christ and have your life changed. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for the reality that you are here and that your loving kindness shows in all aspects of our life. Heal us of our past. Father God, heal us because so many of us are stuck in the past and stuck in all the things that we've gone through in our lives. We don't know which way to move. We don't know what is going on. But we do know that you are here. We thank you for your loving kindness in our life, your grace, your graciousness. Redeem us for your goodness and your mercy and help us to see you as fully God in our life. Heal us of our past. In your precious name we pray and all God's saints would say, Amen. 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 Again, I thank you so much for joining us today and I hope that this has been a blessing to you. But the question that I have for you is very simple. Where are you? Are you with God is nowhere? God is now here. You have to decide it. And as a believer, we should be sitting at the place saying, God is now here, but I know that you may be at a place of despair. Even if maybe you don't know Jesus and you're still here and you're going, I don't know. I don't feel him anywhere. Well, he wants you to be there. He loves you. He wants you to be a part of his family. As a matter of fact, as the kinsman redeemer, as we talked about, he wants to graft you into his family and make you a part of his tribe. And so he invites you in, and there's an easy way to do it. It, it. It's simply by just, you can repeat the prayer with me or even pray the prayer of your heart, but either way, we want you to take that next step. So why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes with me, and let's pray a prayer that will walk you into that next step with Jesus. Jesus, I thank you so much that you would redeem a broken sinner like me. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Forgive me of my past and give me a future. Heal my present and use it for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, if you ask God to begin healing you, then right now I want you to go online and text us. Let us know in that number below that you have received Christ and you're taking that next step. We want to follow up with you. We have baptisms coming up on August 23rd and we want you to be a part of that and get baptized and make profession of faith to the world that Jesus is your God and he is your king. Guys, he's my king and he's changed my world. And I hope as he redeems you and I, he redeems us for the glory of God and the joy of our souls. Guys, I love you more than you'll ever know. And I'm excited to see what God continues to do with this ministry and with you right now. Let him use you this week.